Good morning, Pastor Ed Kropa here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey, with daily devotions for Monday, December the 14th, 2020. Well, as we start a new week of daily devotions, our reading this morning is uh, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. And if it sounds familiar when you listen to it in a few moments, it probably should. That's because according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus read something very similar to this from the prophet Isaiah in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth at the very beginning of his ministry. And these verses from Isaiah 61 seem to be at least part of what he read, if not most. In their historical context, however, they actually come from that time, again after the Jews had returned home after the Babylonian exile, and were being encouraged by God that God he was bringing good news to the oppressed, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners in the year of God's favor. The difference, however, between the original context and Jesus' reading of this passage centuries later is that when Jesus finished reading, he simply said to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. However, before we listen to and then explore today's passage from Isaiah a little bit further, let's begin first, as we always do, with the service of responsive prayer, namely the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Martin Luther's morning prayer. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all harm and danger. We ask that you would also protect us today from sin and all evil, so that our life and actions may please you. Into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. So listen now to Isaiah 61, 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall bind up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. 
it's obviously a message of, of good news, of joy. And we, starting yesterday in our uh, worship service, um, we're reminded that Advent is a season of joy, a season of, of rejoicing. And that theme will continue through many of the lessons that uh, we'll be looking at in our daily devotions uh, this week. That it that should have an impact on us. That that we should we should reflect that joy in our lives by by what we do, by what we say, and and even quite honestly by by how we look. I'm reminded of the story here about three prospectors who found a rich vein of gold years ago in California during the gold rush days, and they realized what this great discovery they had, and they decided we, we we've got a really good thing here as long as no one else finds out about it. So they, they each took a vow to keep it silent, uh, to keep it secret. And they headed to town to file their claim and get the equipment necessary to mine the gold. But And true to their vows, they didn't say a word to anybody. They filed their claim, they bought the equipment, headed back to their mine. But when they did, a crowd of people followed them. And the reason was because the expression on their faces had given them away. Their faces were aglow in anticipation of the wealth that soon would be theirs. People knew that they must have found something very special, so a crowd followed them out of town. It makes one think whether or not we as Christians, um, an expression on our faces, give ourselves away. The wonderful blessings and the joy that we have in our hearts because of what God has done, continues to do, and promises uh, to do for us uh, in the future. You know, is it is it unmistakable in how we live our lives, and, and again, just simply how our disposition and how we look, that, that people would be attracted to it? I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm hopeful that many times it is, but sometimes it isn't. I'm also reminded of the story about a little girl who once visited went to visit her grandmother in the country. And things were all fine until Sunday because this grandmother went to a very old-fashioned church that kept the Sabbath by forbidding all work, fun, and playing. And the little girl woke up on Sunday and she started right off playing and laughing, as little girls do. And her grandmother immediately rebuked her for breaking the Sabbath. The little girl quieted down, went to church, and later went out for a walk by the barn. And she went over to an old mule, a droopy-eyed, sad-faced, long-eared mule. And she looked at the mule for a while and said, Mr. Mule, you look like you go to my grandmother's church. Um, yeah, what, what do we look like? What do others see um, in our faces? Do they, do they see the joy that, that should be there, that should be ours? Tony Campolo once wrote this. He said, Joy in Christ requires a commitment at working at the Christian lifestyle. Salvation, he says, comes as a gift, but the joy of salvation demands disciplined action. Most Christians I know have just enough of the gospel to make them miserable, but not enough to make them joyful. They know what enough about the biblical message to keep them from doing the things which the world tempts them to do, but they do not have enough of a commitment to God to do those things through which they might experience the fullness of his joy. Do we have that joy in our hearts? Is it reflected in our faces? And Tony Campola here talks about our, our commitment, and, and part of that commitment is a, is a commitment to patience and, and being willing to wait. Um, a fellow by the name of Paul Steen uh, wrote this. He said, My Aunt Grace had a large garden, and one time she showed me how to cut seed potatoes so that each piece had at least one eye, and we planted them in the soil behind the house. The waiting was agony. At first there was no progress at all, but, but Aunt Grace encouraged me to be patient. And when the first green leaves started showing, I was, I was ready to start digging. If there are leaves, then there must be potatoes, I thought. Aunt Grace had to dig up one potato just to show me it was too early. As the potatoes began to form, she would gently brush back the dirt and show me that the potatoes were there, but they weren't ready yet. 
a few new potatoes were good to eat, but if we were to have enough, we needed to let them grow to maturity. The process was so long that I gave up checking my potatoes. It wasn't exciting anymore. It, it took too long. Well, one day, Aunt Grace announced the harvest. We unearthed sacks of potatoes. The harvest was exciting. Every mound was a new discovery. And I found more than potatoes that day. The lesson I learned has served me well. The harvest was worth the wait. But without the wait, there would have been no harvest. Spiritual growth, he says, means planting and waiting. Don't get discouraged. Be thankful even while you're waiting. I think that's a great message for Advent. We've talked about waiting, preparing, rejoicing. That They all kind of flow together from one to another. Um, and, and part of that is understanding that it's not going to be um, instant gratification. And we live in a time and in, in a in a world in which, and, and in a society in which um, we, we want everything, not just now, but yesterday, <laughs> in many cases. And the life of faith isn't, isn't like that. Through and through, uh, it, it involves a faithfulness, a patience, a waiting, but experiencing the joy that these things that we wait for are assured. Our faith, our trust is such that, that what God has promised um, will come to pass. And, and the ultimate thing that God has promised, even if it doesn't happen during our lifetimes, uh, will happen. And we'll awake one day at the end of time, um, you know, when the harvest is ready, so to speak. And so there is good news to preach all the time, but especially this time of year and as we prepare for Christmas and our celebration our annual celebration of our Lord's birth again as I like to say we're reminded of that that promise yet to come that promise that he will return that promise that he will finally um, and fully usher in God's kingdom and so we wait patiently but we wait with joyful hearts let us pray God of power and might, help us to be aware of the needs of people and be prepared to bring joy and good news to people through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great start to your week. Um, we'll see you again tomorrow. Take care.